Earlier this week, I watched The American Gospel. It's a movie that you can find on Amazon, and I will post the link in the comments. But as I watched the movie, there were a few things that really deeply concerned me about it. And one of it was when Nabel said that before he became a Christian, he didn't ever have any encounter with anyone that actually was able to explain to him the gospel and he never heard it. And he was only led to two conclusions. Either one, they didn't know what the gospel of Jesus Christ was. Or number two, they didn't care to tell him. I was raised as a very devout Muslim in the United States. And the fact of the matter was, every time I connected with the Christian, I realized that they didn't know why they believed what they believed. All these other people called themselves Christian, but they never shared the gospel with me. I concluded either they didn't believe the gospel was true, or if they did believe it, they didn't care if I went to hell. You can assume that everyone knows the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most beautiful message that you will ever hear. And this video, it's going to be a lot longer than my other video, which was under 90 seconds. The thing is, I don't want anyone that ever comes across this channel to not understand what the true gospel of Jesus Christ is. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved, Acts 4.12. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a lot, is one of the most beautiful messages that you will ever hear. And to understand the gospel, you have to understand who God is. Who is God? And who is the character of God? First of all, God is infinitely holy. He is so holy, in fact. God is so holy and who he is, is very central into understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the second person of the Godhead. There are three persons. God is one divine being who expresses himself to us and reveals himself to us in three distinct persons. So, the character of God. He is a holy God. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 3, 13 it says your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you cannot look on wickedness with favor and then also in isaiah 59 verse 2 it says but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your god and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear the justice of god for the lord is righteous he loves righteousness, the upright will behold his face. Psalm 11, 7. And also in Psalms 7, verses 11 through 12, it says that God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. The justice of God is shown throughout the Holy Scriptures. But the Lord of hosts will be exalted in judgment, and the Holy God will show himself holy in righteousness. What does this mean for man? Every human being that's ever walked this planet, apart from one man, the person of Jesus Christ, all us men are sinners, and we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 for all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And also in Galatians 3.10 it says, for as, many are, for as many as are of the works of the law under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. So that leads us to a great dilemma. We all think that we are good in our own eyes. And we all think that we do right. And matter of fact, I used to think that I was perfectly justified in my actions before I was saved. But it says in Proverbs 17, verse 15, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them are alike, are an abomination to the Lord. 
And at the very beginning, all the way in Genesis chapter 18, verse 25, it says, Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly. So that leads God's action. While maintaining his holiness and justice, the Bible also affirms that God is love, and that in love he has responded to the plight of man. He is motivated by love, as proven in 1 John chapter 4, verses 8-10. through 10. God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the appropriation for our sins. Appropriation is a sacrifice which satisfies God's wrath. How was God able to satisfy his wrath so that we would not have to perish in hell? And let me be very clear about hell at the moment. Hell is not a place where Lucifer is, holding a pitchfork, poking all the bad people. He is not the ruler of hell. Hell is eternal separation from God. That is where his full wrath is poured out on us. Yes, this might seem a little hellfire and brimstone, but it is what it is. And hell is a place where God's wrath is being poured out continually on sinners who are lost and it is eternity because as i said god is eternal how was god able to come and respond to our plight to our problem of sin how was he able to reconcile man to himself all glory to god well that's where the cross of christ comes in For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as appropriation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration. I say of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Romans chapter 3 verses 23 through 26. So, not only that, but also the resurrection of Christ. He who is delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Romans 4 25. Not only was death and sin defeated on the cross. But Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead and he is alive now. So when you hear people tell you that the word, the Bible, the Holy Bible is alive, they're saying that it is actually alive and you can feel it and you don't need any kind of television show to depict or to get to know who Jesus is. All you must do is ask him, how do we do that? What is our response to this message? What is man's response? What is human being's response to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Repentance begins with the recognition and confession that what God says about us is true. We have sinned. We have all broken the commandments, myself included. I am a sinner. I'm a terrible sinner. I have cussed God out. I have blasphemed his holy name. And what right do I have as a creature of God to do such? There's nothing that I can possibly do to ever make that right with God. Ever. I cannot make it right with him because he is an eternal, infinite being i am finite i'm a creature of god so for i know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you you only i have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge 
Psalm 51, 3 through 4. Point two of man's response. A genuine recognition of our sinfulness and guilt will also lead to genuine sorrow, shame, and even hatred for what we have done. Every day, this sin affects us. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Romans chapter 7, verse 15. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Romans chapter 7, verse 24. A parent's sincerity of confession alone is never definite evidence of genuine repentance. It must be accompanied by turning away from sin. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. As it says in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16. And to be perfectly clear, it is not us that can clean our sins away, but only through faith and the work that Jesus did on the cross. We do not save ourselves, but rather it's the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. And therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. So what does it mean when we put our faith in Jesus Christ? Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the convictions of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1 1. And being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Faith based on the promises of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 And believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Acts 16.31 an example of a believer is one in worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Philippians chapter 3 verse 3. I know that I'm quoting quite a few Bible verses to you, but scripture interprets scripture. As it says in John chapter 1 verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory Glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. So when we say that Jesus Christ is living and the Holy Bible is living, it's because that our God is a living God. And He is a great God, and all glory goes to God for everything that we do that is good. Because He has taught us how to love. We only love because He first loved us. And the genuine assurance of your salvation is true conversion. A true Christian is a new creation and will live a life that reflects God's radical work of recreation in his or her life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. The question Second is, well, Corinthians how do we know five, if faith is seven. real if there's no works? Doesn't the Bible say faith without works is dead? And so don't we have to do works to be saved? Isn't that the argument? Is that what we have to be doing? But there's two understandings of that, and one's biblical, one's not. So the Roman Catholic view of salvation, and really any works-based system of salvation, takes works and puts it at the root and says that works plus your faith in Jesus is what produces salvation. But the Bible teaches that it's not the root, it's actually the fruit, that your faith alone in Jesus that is what saves, and then a, a life that has been saved, a sanctified, regenerated heart, produces fruit, the fruit of good works. And so you know a person's been saved because of their fruit, but the fruit is not the reason they're saved. They're saved by God, by grace, through faith in Christ. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. So what does all of this mean? It means that we have all broken the Ten Commandments. If you look closely and under inspection of the Ten Commandments, the first four are how we can love God with all of our mind, heart, and soul. 
And then the second great commandment is depicted in commandments 4 through 10 of how to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And I do love each and every one of you, and I'm really wanting to impress upon you, as Nabel said in the beginning of the American Gospel, he only could reach two conclusions as to why no Christian had ever told him the Gospel. One, they didn't know it themselves, or two, they didn't care enough to let him know. And it's also very disheartening to know that a comment was made by Paul Washer when he said that most most pastors that are preaching from a pulpit right now do not know what the gospel is. They would rather show you a light show. If I want to see a light show, I'll go to a movie. I love Star Wars just as much as anybody else. And I love to watch movies. But in the pulpit, when a pastor's preaching, the gospel needs to be known because he can never assume that you know the gospel. Most people don't know this gospel, and to be frank with you, I didn't really realize it myself, and I didn't understand it until I was 37 years old. Yes, my own testimony is very much biblical and very much systematic. The first thought that I had after I was, I'm a broken sinner. I am very much a broken sinner because I'm not perfect. Do not follow me. Don't follow Susan. Follow Jesus Christ. He is the one true way. He is the way, the truth, and the light. And no one can go through to the Father except through him. And I'm here to tell you the truth. Because I do love you. Because hell, as I said earlier, is not a place of fun. And it's not going to be a jaunt party. It is the full wrath of God poured out on souls for all eternity. And if I'm sorry if that scares you, but it is terrifying because I do love you and I do care for you enough to tell you the truth. Whenever I laid on my bed and I was cussing the Lord out, I called him all kinds of names because of all the pain I've been through in my entire life. I lost my mother. I'm, I'm watching my father go through dementia. I, <laughs> I've not had an easy life and I thought that God was getting enjoyment out of my pain, but he wasn't. And the question that was brought to my mind was how can I be saying such things about my Lord, about God? How can I say such things about God without ever taking the time to get to know him? How do you get to know him? You pray for his wisdom. Seek his wisdom. When I say pray, I'm not just passing you off. I'm telling you that if you sit and you put your mind on God and you actually ask with your heart to seek his wisdom and if you feel convicted right now talk to God he is only a prayer way and I've already made a video on how you can pray and the the benefits of prayer because it is a relationship the true gospel of Jesus Christ is going to take more than 87 seconds the gospel of Jesus Christ working in your heart working to mold your heart into a new heart where you're a new creation where you're a new creature and you desire new things it's a lifelong work when the rich man when the rich young man came to Jesus and said that he was good and that he had done good works there was nothing else he needed to do but how could he get to heaven Jesus told him to sell all of his things and pick up his cross and follow him but the rich young man could not do it what will it profit you to gain the entire world but lose your soul we have to take our sin and nail it to the cross alongside Jesus we have to repent of our sins that we've committed against him Jesus Christ walked this planet a long time ago and he died on the cross but on the third day, he resurrected, and he is alive right now, sitting at the right hand of God the Father. I do pray that this message opens your eyes and opens your heart. And if you ever need to talk to anyone, you can leave a comment below or reach out to me, and I will be glad to talk with you. But thank you so much for listening, and may the grace and the peace and the love of Jesus Christ be with you all, always.